Welcome everyone. This video will introduce some key concepts related to course design and learning objectives. Let's start with a scenario that most students can relate to. So they're walking out of an exam and they're saying to themselves, you know, that test didn't match what I studied at all. Something was a complete surprise about that test for the students. As instructors, we get to see the other side of the story. We cover all this material in class and then we're confused when students aren't able to apply it on the exam or aren't able to recall things that we know they heard, that, it's, that they studied, that they worked on. So it's frustrating for students to have no idea what it is that the professor wants from them, and extreme frustration isn't a good learning mindset. There are ways, though, to maximize the great moments in teaching. So imagine grading some student projects at the end of the term, and you're able to see all the learning gains that your students have made. You're able to see where they've connected the course material into the project that they've turned into you. Think about how happy your students would be when they realize they've mastered a new skill um, and that new skill is something really important for them, uh, thinking about their career or future classes that they'll take. So having a well-aligned course really can make these moments happen both more easily and more often. So many of the frustrations we encounter as instructors result from misalignment in our courses. We walk in on the first day of class and we're excited to share our knowledge and our passion with our students. We want to encourage them to engage with class material and inspire them to pursue further learning in our fields. So one of the big challenges that comes along with these aspirations is that there's not necessarily a clear map for how to do these things. So this video will provide a brief overview of the concept of backward design. And backward design is essentially the process of drawing a map between the first day of class and the last day of your course so that your students leave your class knowledgeable, skilled, and passionate about your discipline. We call this course design process backward because most instructors, when they're thinking about designing a course, they focus first on what content they're gonna teach or what readings they're gonna use instead of looking at the end point of the course first. So with backward design, we ask ourselves, what do we want students to know, to be able to do, and to value when they walk out of the course on the last day? The map that we've designed for this video indicates that by the end of the video, you'll be able to identify three main types of learning objectives, you'll be able to identify the components of strong learning objectives, and you'll, you'll be able to describe the connection between assessment and learning objectives, as well as learning activities. And so that kind of lays out at the end of this video where you should be, those are my learning objectives for this video. That's the beginning of our map. So I've said a lot about learning objectives already. Let's define that. It's quite simple. They're just the descriptions of what you want your students to know and be able to do as a result of taking your course. So a commonly used framework for thinking about learning objectives has three categories, and they are knowledge, skills, and values. What I want to do next is to quickly go over what a sort of a first draft of learning objectives in each of these three categories might look like. So let's start with knowledge. What knowledge do you want them to have? For example, in an intro physics course, you might expect your students to know a formula that calculates the force of gravity. In a biochemistry course, you might expect them to know the structure of amino acids. So those are just a couple examples of factual knowledge an instructor might expect students to have. We'll look at how we can refine these learning objectives later in the video. So coming up with those knowledge-based objectives is often relatively easy. But most instructors want their students to go beyond learning facts and procedures and develop the skills that are relevant to the discipline. So for example, instructors may want their students to develop computational skills or writing skills or the ability to physically manipulate and deal with a piece of equipment in the lab or in the clinic. The third category in the framework is the values that students will hold at the end of your course. Or sometimes um, we talk about the attitudes that students will have at the end of the course. These values are really often so implicit in our discipline that we don't even think about articulating them as learning objectives. So for example, in the sciences, students are expected to value the scientific method as an approach to problem solving, but that might not be the first thing you think of as what you're hoping for students to gain out of any one particular course. So now that we've looked at the general types of learning objectives that instructors might have for a course, we need to look at how to optimize our learning objectives so that they're truly useful for us as instructors and for our students. So useful learning objectives typically embody six different traits, and there's a good mnemonic to help you remember all six of them, all the components of useful learning objectives, and it's the acronym ALARMS. So effective learning objectives are first active. 
a useful learning objective requires your students to do something to prove that they have met the learning objective. Every learning objective should include an active verb. So that's going to be what it is that your students are going to do. So one resource for finding active verbs for learning objectives in any discipline can be found um, in this Bloom's Taxonomy Wheel. Um, the Bloom's Taxonomy has different categories of knowledge and skills you might want your students to develop. And then it provides active verbs that you could use when you're writing learning objectives. Okay, so then getting to the L in alarms, uh, good learning objectives are learner-centered. So, so course objectives should be based on what your students' knowledge, skills, and values will be at the end of the course. So often you might write um, goals for the course and think to yourself, okay, so in this course I'll teach the history of my discipline. So that is a very teacher-centered objective. That's what you will do. Maybe it's an instruction objective. Um, but you need to keep in mind that what we teach may not be what our students learn, although our goal, of course, is that the two are the same. So in order to increase um, the correlation between what we teach and what they learn, if we write our objectives in a way that's thinking of the learner, what will they learn rather than what will I teach? Learner-centered. So another aspect of learner-centered objectives is that they're written in language students can understand, at least for the most part, at the beginning of the course. And that's part of the, the idea of a map from the beginning of the course to the end. Students see those learning objectives at the beginning and they know where they're supposed to end up. If they're written in very um, you know, jargony ways or with a lot of terms that students aren't going to understand, then it's difficult for them to use those learning objectives to understand where they're, where they're hoping to be or where they're supposed to be by the end of the course. All right, so the second A is for attainable. Um, our courses exist within a context of real life. They take place within a full curriculum and in a relatively short time period, and only one of the many obligations that we and our students have to meet as people. So uh, we need to write our objectives recognizing that we're not going to be able to transform our students from novices to experts in just a few months. It's important to have high expectations, of course, but the expectations also have to be reasonable um, given the time period for the course, the previous knowledge of the students, and all of the other responsibilities that require um, our time and our students' time. All right, so then uh, R is for relevant. Uh, relevant, useful learning objectives um, are going to be relevant for the student population that's taking our course. So for teaching a course for non-majors, we might not need to get our students to memorize the minutia, you know, a lot of detailed formulas or other things like that. We might want to focus instead on learning objectives um, that, that really um, promote the basic skills and values that every citizen in our society should have from our discipline for that type of non-majors course. And then learning objectives that are relevant, of course, for a majors course or for a graduate course would be um, written with that population in mind. All right, so moving on to M, M is for measurable. Every useful learning objective has assessment implicitly built into its construction. So if you get only one thing from this video, I want you to always ask yourself when you're writing learning objectives, how will I know my students have accomplished this? Every time you write an objective or a goal, whether it's for a whole course or for a unit or for one day's lesson. All right, so then specific. Um, useful learning objectives are not vague. Every instructor, regardless of the discipline, wants students to have, say, improved analytical skills or better writing at the end of the course. But these kind of goals, just improved or better, um, are really too vague to be useful as learning objectives. A more useful objective specifies how the student's writing skills will be improved. So for example, an instructor might include in their syllabus this objective about a lab report. So it describes improvement to be sure, but it's very specific that the um, student is able to create a clear succinct thesis about their interpretation of lab results, for example, um, that they are able to um, describe alternative interpretations of those results. So this gets very specifically into what's going to be improved in the student's writing. All right, so now we've looked at the types of learning objectives and we've looked at the traits of useful objectives. So let's classify and evaluate some learning objectives and start thinking about assessment and alignment. So revisiting our knowledge learning objectives from earlier, which of these three objectives don't satisfy the alarms criteria? 
Okay, so the first two both have active verbs. You might have noticed, identify and calculate. So these are really learner-centered. Um, that's what the learner will do. Uh, they're worded to describe what the students will learn, not what the instructor is planning on teaching. The learning objectives also all seem attainable. It's hard to know, you know, without knowing the details of who is in each of the courses, we might not be able to judge the relevance very well, but it seems safe to say that these objectives um, are relatively useful in a higher ed classroom. In terms of being measurable, the top two objectives give an idea of what kind of assessments a student might see in this course. But the third objective is not clearly measurable at all. Again, the top two objectives are very specific, but it's clear that the third learning objective needs some work. So one possible revision of that learning objective is seen on the screen. Uh, this new version includes an active learner-centered verb. It seems attainable and relevant. It's measurable, unlike before. And the revised objective also identifies the specific context in which students will be applying this knowledge. So now let's look at our learning objectives for the skills that we want our students to develop. Which objective doesn't seem to fit the alarms framework? So it's common for instructors to choose the word appreciate in learning objectives, but when it comes down to it, there really is not a good mechanism to measure appreciation. And looking at the third uh, learning objectives, we need to reword it so that there's an active verb that lends itself to measurement. So even if your discipline isn't in the biological sciences, you can likely imagine how uh, an instructor might assess a student's ability to appreciate the role of different um, procedures in the lab. So values-based learning objectives can be really challenging to write for two reasons. First, Many of the values we expect students to adopt in our discipline are really ingrained in us. As I noted before, we're experts in our field and we may not even think about making them explicit. So once we overcome that hurdle, it still is difficult to come up with active verbs to describe what a value system looks like. This can really be very challenging. So the best way to figure out how to phrase the learning objectives is to ask yourself, how will I know? So on the screen, you can see how we've just reworked one of the learning objectives from earlier in the video. How would you rework the other one? Okay, so we've talked a lot about learning objectives and how to make them really useful learning objectives. So a next step in the backward course design process after establishing clear and useful learning objectives is to design the assessments that will help you measure student learning. After that, you would develop learning activities that will give students opportunities to develop and practice using the knowledge, skills, and values identified in your objectives. So notice how the process for developing assessments and learning activities explicitly refers to the learning objectives. This ensures that the assessments and activities are well aligned with the objectives. Good alignment is very important, so I want to take a moment to describe some of the pitfalls that can occur if the elements of a course are not well aligned. So without strong alignment, when you assess your students, you might not be measuring what you think you're measuring. A useful exercise is reflecting on a test or a project that your students didn't do particularly well on and asking yourself two questions. First, did the assignment or assessment actually tell you whether the students had met your objectives for their learning? If the answer to that question is yes, then the assessment is well aligned with the objectives but the next question would be, did I give students enough opportunities to practice the skills or the knowledge that they would need in order to be successful on that assessment or assignment? So if the answer to that question is yes, then that would mean that your learning activities are well aligned with your learning objectives and your assessments. So very often when something doesn't work well in a course, when something seems to be off or not, just not quite right, the answer to at least one of the above questions is no. So if you answered no to the first question, you're going to want to spend some time looking at different options for assessing students' learning and consider how to optimize the alignment between learning objectives and assessments. If your answer to the second question is no, then your learning activities in class or out of class are likely out of alignment with your learning objectives. So considering in this case, your next steps would be um, what thinking about what activities you could implement during class time or what activities could students do as homework or practice or study that would prepare them better for the assessments in your course. So we'll end on that note, but I hope this video has given you a starting point for thinking about how to approach designing or redesigning your own courses.